time being 8.15, and a committee that starts on time ends on time, we will uh, get to the business of the Health and Human Services Reform Committee. I'd like to start out by thanking everyone and welcoming them here this morning for uh, the remainder of the 2017-2018 biennium. And in the interest of time, I'd like to invite the members and staff to just go around the room quickly since this is our first meeting, introduce themselves with uh, their name and uh, the area that they represent. I will kick off and then we'll go to my left. I'm Joe Schumacher and I represent Southwest Minnesota. Good morning, my name is Annie Pericini. I supervise the GOP legislative assistant staff and your CLA uh, has been with the caucus for 24 hours. So uh, today's our first day, so I'm helping her out uh, with minutes. So I'm your guest CLA today. My name is Emily Richter. Hi. Um, Representative Tina Liebling from Rochester. Liz Olson, Duluth, the western half. Julie Sandstead from Hibbing. Cassandra Moore, DFL Caucus Research. Rena Moran, St. Paul. Dan Tice, St. Cloud. Brian Cresha, Little Falls. I'm Elizabeth Clarkvist with House Research, and I cover um, public health and health department issues. Uh, Randy Chun with House Research, cover mainly medical assistance and Minnesota care. I'm Bethany Drobiella, Republican Caucus Research. Oh, Deb Keel, um, Kirkston. Uh, good morning, Dave Baker, uh, Wilmer, Candiaway County, Western Minnesota. Dwayne Palm, Byron, Olmsted, Dodge County. Uh, Glenn Grunhagen, McLeod, Sibley County, Southwest Minneapolis. I'm Laura Larson, and I will be the committee administrator. All right, thank you for that. That was pretty painless, I think, as we uh, start out. And uh, Sarah, if you could please introduce yourself. I'm Sarah Sunderman. I'm with House Research. I cover um, <clears throat> child protection issues, mental health, chemical dependency. Okay, uh, in your packets, you have the committee rules and procedures, as well as the memos to create the subcommittees on child care access and affordability, as uh, well as the subcommittee on the long-term care and aging. Um, as stated in the memo, those committees will hold meetings with presentations and bill hearings, and we look forward to the vibrant work that they'll, those committees will lead to over the next uh, legislative session. If you have any questions about any of those, please uh, let my committee administrator, Laura Larson, know on that. And uh, with that, we will uh, change gavels here quick and move into House File 99. Okay, with that, the bill we have for consideration is HF 99 by Chair Schumacher. Would you like to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't believe we have a quorum just yet to move it, but as uh, okay. soon as we do, I will uh, be sure to do that. Uh, House File 99, uh, members, is a clone bill for House File 1. It takes out the uh, provisions that deal with health and human services reforms, the bill that we want to hear, t uh, the provisions that we want to hear in this committee. In order to fast track uh, the process a little bit, we included uh, several clone bills in order to move it through the process a little faster. This uh, being one of the stops here today, House File 99 being one of those. The objective with House File 1, uh, beyond just the, the premium relief for Minnesotans, is to provide uh, uh, some reforms to the, the system and the way we do things. We want to try and increase access between patients and doctors to uh, create competition in the market that allows for patients to have choices in the types of coverage that they have and to provide for transparency not only for legislators but for patients as well in the, the proceedings that they have with their doctors. Uh, before we get uh, into it too much, I have asked uh, House Research to walk through this and give a little technical overview of what this bill and the provisions there do. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Schumacher. 
uh, at this time, uh, Ms. Claire Wist, Clark Bist, please state your name and title for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Elizabeth Clarkvist with House Research, and I'm just gonna um, do a walkthrough of House File 90, 99. Starting with Section 1, um, current law requires health plan companies to file proposed uh, health plan rates with the Commissioner of Commerce for approval, and Section 1 makes compiled data about those proposed rates public 10 days after the proposed rates are filed. Um, this is compiled data and it's organized by health plan and by geographic rating area. And Mr. Chair, should... Uh, just a minute. Are you finished with your presentation? No. Ms. Clark? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to ask, do you want members to ask questions as we go or would you prefer that we wait and hold questions until Ms. Clark this gets through the whole bill? Oh. Uh, according to the script they have written here, I'm supposed to wait till after the presentation, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we have a quorum now. So with that, uh, Chair Schumacher, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I move that uh, House File 99 be recommended to be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Okay, with that, uh, Ms. Clark, <laughs> Clarkquist, do uh, you want to continue with your summary of the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, continuing with sections two to seven, they amend statutes governing health maintenance organizations. Under current law, HMOs are required to be organized as nonprofit corporations in Minnesota. Sections two to seven remove the nonprofit requirement and allow HMOs to be organized as nonprofit or for profit corporations organized in Minnesota or in another state. Moving on to section eight. Section eight authorizes a health carrier to sell an individual health plan to an employee of a small employer if the small employer, the eligible employee, and the individual health plan comply with uh, new provisions in the 21st Century Cures Act. This is federal legislation what, that was enacted in December, and it created a new type of health reimbursement arrangement, or HRA, for small employers with fewer than 50 employees that don't sponsor a group health plan. This new HRA is called a Qualified Small Employer Health Reimbursement Arrangement. If a small em employer establishes one of these, the small employer can contribute pre-tax money to the HRA for the employee, for the employee to use for qualified out-of-pocket medical expenses and for insurance premiums for an individual or family health plan purchased by the employee. So the, this, the, the amendment in this language allows health carriers to sell these types of plans. Moving on to section nine, this relates to unauthorized provider services. This is referred to as the surprise billing section. And this surprise billing describes a situation in which an enrollee seeks services from an in-network provider or facility and ends up receiving services from a provider or facility that is out of network, often without the enrollee's knowledge. Um, under this section, an enrollee can consent to service can consent to rece receive services from a non-participating provider who works in the participating provider's practice setting from a non-participating lab or from a non-participating provider if the enrollee's health plan requires a referral. So subdivision one um, describes unauthorized provider services. Paragraph A lists the services that constitute unauthorized provider services. Paragraph B specifies that emergency services are not covered by this section. Paragraph C provides that certain services are not unauthorized if the enrollee provides advanced written consent, acknowledging that using the provider or obtaining the service might result in costs not covered by the health plan. And subdivision two specifies that the cost sharing requirements for unauthorized provider services are the same as those that apply to services from a participating provider.
Moving on to section 10, section 10 governs balance billing. Um, the, the language in this section is currently found in section 62K.11 paragraph A, which applies to health plans in the individual and small group markets. Um, this moves it to chapter 62Q, which um, also makes it apply to the large group market. And it prohibits a provider in a health plan network from billing an enrollee for any amount that's in addition to the amount the provider agreed to receive for the health care service from the health plan company. Um, it still allows the carrier to bill an enrollee for a copayment, deductible, or coinsurance. Um, section 11 is transition of care coverage for calendar year 2017 for enrollees who experience an involuntary termination of coverage. So this provides for transition, transition of care coverage for enrollees who experience an involuntary termination in the individual market in 2016 and who obtain new coverage in an individual health plan for calendar year 2017. This language is based on the continuity of care language in current law in, chap in section 62Q.56 subdivision 2, but um, continuity of care language in current law does not apply to the individual market. So this uncoded transition of care coverage section up expands those requirements to cover um, certain enrollees in the individual market. Subdivision 1 defines terms. Subdivision 2 specifies um, who the transition of care coverage language applies to. It applies to an enrollee who experienced an involuntary termination of coverage from an individual health plan in November or December 2016 and who enrolled in a new plan that goes into effect in January or February 2017. Subdivision 3 um, has the requirements for transition of care coverage. Um, if an enrollee is eligible, it requires the enrollee's new health plan company to authorize the enrollee to receive services from a provider who was in network for the enrollee's 2016 health plan but's out of network for the 2017 health plan. Um, this, this applies to enrollees who have certain health conditions or who, who have a limited life expectancy. And it applies, it, it, allows, it allows these services for um, up to 120 days. It, requ it also requires the Commissioner of Management and Budget to reimburse the enrollee's new health plan company for costs that are attributed to authorized transition of care services. Subdivision 4 establishes limitations and Subdivision 5 has requirements for requests for authorization. Um, moving on to Section 12 of this Bill, this requires a state agency that incurs administrative costs related to implementation of this act and that does not receive an appropriation to um, implement this act within the limits of existing appropriations. Section 13 is an appropriation section. It appropriates $15 million from the general fund to the Commissioner of Man Management and Budget to reimburse health plan companies for costs that are attributed to transition of care coverage. And section 14 is the repealer. It repeals section 62D.12, subdivision 9. This is related to the for-profit HMO language. And it repeals section 62K.11. And this is the balance billing language that's in current law. <coughs> Mr. Chair, that's the end of my summary. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, at this time, we'll take additional questions from members. The members just remind you, this is, uh, we know that the debate over health care can go far afield. <coughs> just encourage you to ask questions based on the, uh, uh, the provisions that are included in this HF 99 as much as possible. Okay, with that, do we have questions? Representative Liebman. Well, I'll start, Mr. Chair, and just to do just some clarification on the actual bill from Ms. Clark. This, oh, yours, okay. there you are now. Okay. Um, so, uh, going back to the first <coughs> section that you talked about, the non-public data section, could you just explain that a little more? It's, well, see if I'm understanding this correctly. So, currently. There is no public, this, we're talking about the procedure by which the Commissioner of, of um, Commerce approves rates 
for health plans, correct? For health insurance. And uh, currently, the, uh, the plans file their proposed rates and then the commissioner does whatever the commissioner does, works with them, tries to get them lower, examines them to see if they're reasonable. And then once the commissioner approves them, decides there's no alternative, basically, they get released to the public. That's the current process, right? And this changes that process exactly how? Maybe you could say, first of all, am I correct about the current process? And then what does the bill do to that process? Glenn. <laughs> oh, uh, Ms. Clark, this. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling, that's my understanding of the current process. Um, this changes the current process by requiring the Commissioner of Commerce to release onto the Commissioner's website compiled data by health plan and by geographic rating area of any changes in rates based on the proposed, based on the submitted proposed rates within 10 days after they're submitted. Okay. Representative Levy. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's, that was uh, what I had. So uh, f just for, in terms of clarifying questions for Ms. Barkvist. Other questions, members? Seeing none, I think we'll take up uh, the amendments at this time. I have an amendment laid labeled DE1. Who is offering this amendment? Mr. Chair, I think that's my amendment. Uh, Representative Liebling, do you move it? Um, I would like to move the amendment, Mr. Chair, but, but you know, before we, before we get to moving the amendment, so I thought I was just asking a clarifying question, but I, I guess I'd like to ask a question of the bill's author before we actually move the amendment and get off the bill that we have here, if well, that would be okay. Sure, go ahead, Representative. Right, so um, Chair Schumacher, since this is your bill, um, so I, I was under the understanding that we really have two goals for this House File 1 that is moving extremely rapidly. This is the bill that your caucus tried to skip this committee process altogether and go right to conference committee. So obviously the House GOP thinks this is, has real urgency. And I had understood that the real urgency that, this, that the state is facing has to do, is kind of twofold. One is that a lot of families who are paying premiums on the individual market are facing very high increases this year, 2017. And uh, they already have had to make decisions about buying insurance and the deadline is January 31st for them to make decisions in the open enrollment period and decide what they're gonna buy. So there's some urgency for them to know whether we're going to give them a rebate and uh, how much it's going to be. So that's the number one goal I, I'm assuming. It's certainly that's our goal in the DFL is to make sure that people get immediate help and know what they're going to have to spend this year for 2017. The second goal I thought was to try to stabilize the market in 2018 because we all know that the market is very unstable. Um, I think the commissioner of Commerce or his uh, deputy, uh, I'm hoping is, is here or will be here to talk about, about the bill and about the market, but we all know that we almost lost our individual market in this last round that, that some insurers were planning to, were threatening to pull out. And that was why the commissioner had to approve higher rates than he would have wanted to um, and some other things. So I thought we had two goals and I'd really like to hear from you whether those are the goals that you share reducing premiums and letting people know what they're going to have to pay for 2017 and stabilizing the market for 2018. Chair Schumacher. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling, and thank you for the question with this. Absolutely, this is uh, an urgency that um, uh, I think we all agree needs to be fast-tracked through the process. It was months ago already that uh, the Commissioner of Commerce had uh, called the individual market uh, in a state of emergency, and so uh, we're trying to act fast with this. And the, the premium relief is, is something that I think we're, we're all pretty close on and what we, what we need to do there in order to make sure that 
Uh, Minnesotans get a little bit of relief for the the rates that they have this year. The the rest of the things that we're trying to do in order to stabilize the market, we're also trying to make sure that uh, there is a market and that there's access to that market, that we have transparency in the market and that there's competition in the market so that there are things that uh, there's products for people to buy next year. And that's that's part of what we're trying to do here. The reason to, to move that up is that, uh, as we know, these the initial the filings get done in May, and we want uh, people to, we want the health plans to have as much time as possible to consider Minnesota in the process. And if we don't move on this uh, quickly enough, we're going to have trouble attracting anyone or even having them consider us as an option unless we uh, move forward. Representative Lieberman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Chair Schumacher. So on that, if you're um, in agreement on those goals, I'd like to ask you specifically to explain then how this bill, uh, obviously the bill that's before this committee has nothing about premium rebates. That's been taken out. Um, although I would say that I, I would have, I think that that proposal belonged in this committee and should go to the Health and Human Services Finance Committee since it's a finance proposal. But leaving that aside for a moment, how does this bill that's before this committee stabilize the market in 2018? That's the urgency we have. How specifically does this bill accomplish that goal? Chair Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling. It does so in uh, a variety of ways with the the uh, transparency sections in particular, especially with the section one that we have of this bill. When we talk about the classification of insurance filing data, if we would have had this provision into law last year, we would have been able to do something ahead of time because we still would have been in session at the time that this was going through. Now, you could argue that we didn't get uh, um, as much going through in the last bit of session last year as we, we could have possibly. However, had we had this information ahead of time, we could have um, at least known ahead than waiting until October, November to find out what these final rates are and maybe uh, done something to uh, stabilize the market more then uh, to uh, be able to provide relief ahead of time so that people were able to make purchasing decisions uh, far ahead of time than what they're having now with that uh, January 31st deadline. and. Uh, that alone is is uh, a way that we'll be able to stabilize the market into the future and and uh, um, have a market in 2018. Uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Representative Schumacher, Chair Schumacher, you know, respectfully, I what you've just described is if we what you've basically just said is uh, we want to know about it sooner next year so that we can do something. And I guess my question is, what is the do something? You know, if you, you don't need to know that next year, we're, we're not, um, you know, unless something happens, we know that premiums are probably not gonna go down. Maybe they won't shoot up as high, Pro probably they won't because there's been kind of a correction as we all know that Minnesota rates started extremely low. And so the percentage increases are look, look bigger because they start from a lower base. Not to minimize the huge dollar impact on people, but this is a nationwide <laughs> thing, not just a Minnesota thing. So the question really is, great, you're gonna know about it sooner, but what is the, you said we would have done something. What's the something? What is the something? That something should be in this bill. Can you tell us what is the thing that this bill is doing to actually stabilize the market, to make sure that we don't lose more plans, to make sure that plans don't come in and tell us they need to charge a zillion more dollars to our consumers to stay in the market? What are you doing to help people? Chair Schumacher. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you uh, for the question there. And thank you for recognizing, too, that uh, the percentage increases, even though they're, they're uh, um, uh, relative to what other states are doing, they are still very significant increases. And if we would have had Section 1 into uh, law before, it may have been the premium relief that we're, we're debating about now. That would have been in place uh, before we had left session this last year, and people would have been able to make purchasing decisions in October, November, December, instead of waiting to now to see if we were going to have a special session, if we're going to have the second special session or the third special session that was debated on this. And uh, now, and where we go, forward with it and just what it looks like now, that would have stabilized the market so that people were actually buying um, in the process that we have now. If you're looking at keeping the markets open, uh, 
look at sections two through seven with uh, bringing forward the non uh, bringing forward for profit organizations into the state so that there are markets and and choices moving forward. We already know that uh, if things continue the way they are going into next year, that there's about 62 counties in the state that are going to be left with Blue Connect as their only option. And with the narrow markets that we have there, that's that's all they're going to have. And with uh, the regulations being that if you uh, pull out of the market that you can't come back in for several years. This is what we're we're left with if we don't move forward with some of these and move forward now so that these other uh, carriers have time to look at what we have in the market and and what we might have available. Oh, Mr. Chair. Representative Liebling. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Schumacher. And, you know, I guess that the real question will be whether, you know, um, yeah, it's fine to say let's let private insurers come into our market. I think that in a market where our nonprofits are saying we can't make any money, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's what they're saying. I, I think it would be very interesting to see if any for-profits think they can come in and make money where a nonprofit says it can't, where none of the nonprofits say they're, they're making money. I mean, that remains to be seen. But, you know, I think this is really the question of the day for this hearing is whether this bill does anything to stabilize the market in 2018. And I think it's pretty clear right now that this bill does absolutely nothing to help people reduce their costs for 2017. Now, I get that those pieces are going elsewhere. But um, again, I contend that this should be in this committee. And Mr. Chair, with that, I would like to move my delete all amendment. Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. I got another question here. Uh, actually, to uh, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Representative Liebling. Um, and Mr. Chair, I'm going to um, ask you to consider deviating from your um, plan a little bit uh, this morning. Uh, before we hear the amendments, um, I think it would be useful um, to hear from Commissioner Franz, who's here this morning. Um, I think it would be helpful for us as a committee to hear the concerns about the implementation of the bill uh, before we start amending the bill. Um, we have been, uh, and a number of us uh, in this room have been in meetings since last fall trying to work through how to implement relief uh, in the individual market for premium payers. And a lot of that has been happening uh, in private meetings. And gratefully now here we are in session in a public meeting where we can talk openly. And I think for our sake and for Minnesotans sake, we should get whatever the concerns are about how we move forward with this bill onto the table. So I would respectfully ask that before we start amending the bill that we ask Commissioner Franz to come up and share his perspective about it so that we're informed before we start tinkering with uh, Representative Schumacher's bill. Oh, thank you for the, that request. And uh, on a bipartisan basis, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. So if Re uh, Commissioner Franz would come forward. A couple of things I just say based on the discussion so far is that there's other reform bills to address some of the uh, concerns Representative Liebling has as far as competition. This uh, particular bill, uh, which was HF1 originally, and now it's broken up into a couple different bills, uh, from my standpoint, is a one-year band-aid to try to stabilize the market and then to also put provisions to allow the private market to introduce uh, some reforms and additional competition. So this one bill, you know, it's not a one bill cure all. We have other bills being introduced to address reform in the marketplace, to stabilize the market, increase competition, and do additional things uh, to keep providers in the market. With that, uh, Representative or Commissioner uh, Franz, do you want to address the uh, the questions that were raised by uh, Representative Murphy? Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Committee. I know that this is uh, this. Uh, bill is moving in a lot of different committees and I appreciate your willingness to be flexible and allow me to begin some opening comments here because I think it really is critical to put in perspective what needs to be done now and what needs to be done in the next few weeks. The governor in October began this process of providing a direction to come up with premium relief and as Representative Murphy mentioned we've had a number of meetings with a number of legislators and the plans. We've been working diligently around the clock in October and November to come up with this plan. Now the governor's goal in developing his health insurance subsidy is to provide immediate relief to Minnesotans, many of whom have already paid their January premiums. 
And there are thousands more, we believe, who are out there who have not yet determined whether they are able to afford health insurance due to the uncertainty caused by the lack of action so far by the legislature. The governor and the commissioners are eager to work with all of you to come up with a way and a package that works for Minnesotans and health plans to deliver premium relief and long-term relief, but we really believe that's the second step. The first step is providing premium relief today. All unvetted changes that are being proposed should go through the process and should be analyzed so that they can be thoroughly determined in the next step, the next step being reform for 2018. The governor has made it clear to, to many of you, to the public and to me, he is open to all issues when it comes to reform for 2018. But today and this week, he's asked the legislature and he's asked me to come specifically to ask you to focus on premium relief. As every day goes by, there are people who are left wondering if relief is coming. What is the relief? And when will I receive the relief? The governor's plan was proposed in October in part to help stabilize the individual market by letting people know that help was on the way and that every day that goes by without doing that, we're, let, we're letting people down. They don't know the, the effect of what we might do, and we're lessening the opportunity, opportunity to positive, positively affect the market. I just want to take one minute to describe the governor's plan and then talk about House File 1. The governor's relief plan was devised in a way with the plans so that we could implement it as quickly as possible. In our analysis, the reason it's so simple is because it utilizes the current economic transaction that occurs between the insured and the insurance company. There's no need to replicate that transaction. There's no need to start a whole new government program when we have a mechanism called the invoice that we can deliver the premium relief through. The plans can implement this within several months depending upon what part of the month we pass this plan. So the timeline for the governor and why it's so short is that we did it in discussions with the plans. It relies on the current invoice. The governor's plan does not create a new program and it does not require new data to be collected from Minnesotans. Insurance are currently invoicing their customers every month. The governor's plan simply requires the insurance plan to include Mr. a 25% rebate on the invoice. Let me describe an example. Mr. Chair. James Smith. Uh, Commissioner yes. France, just a minute. Uh, Representative Dean. Uh, excuse me, Commissioner Franz, uh, Mr. Chair, but um, I think the, the testimony is likely to uh, Representative Liebling's delete all amendment, which I believe will be the governor's plan. Would it make more sense to do that? Uh, I, I, was, I was thinking we were speaking to the House File 1. Would it make more sense if, if the commissioner wants to speak to the governor's plan to do that at the time that Representative Liebling presents her amendment? or? I was uh, wondering why we, I think that that's why we, we moved this up was to speak to one, but uh, maybe. Yeah, the request was from Representative uh, Murphy to hear the uh, Commissioner Franz's <coughs> input on the implementation of uh, HF 99. And Mr. Chair, from my perspective, it doesn't matter Murphy. the order. Um, we take it in if we're gonna hear the information from the commissioner, we may as well just go ahead and give it to us all now right now and then we can ask him questions for your consideration mr chair okay uh why don't you finish your testimony will you be around to answer questions if uh, things come up or provide additional uh input to uh the amendments that we'll be considering i would like to i am as i mentioned sort of triple book this morning and i do have some commitments to some other committees but i'll do what i can to try to honor all the commitments i, I appreciate okay that. mr chair if i could just representative Liebling. thank you mr chair um commissioner rothman we're hoping is going to be here i mean as you know commissioner rothman is the commissioner of commerce which is a little could so he hopefully can speak a bit more to the portion of the bill that is uh, in Representative Schumacher's bill. And um, the reason that um, Commissioner Franz, who's the Commissioner of Minnesota uh, Management and Budget, is involved in this thing is that, um, you, you know, he's, he's got sort of a different angle on all of this. So the actual insurance and, you know, the rate setting and the things that affect the insurance market are more in the in the bucket of things that Commissioner Rothman deals with, and we're hoping that he is going, he or one of his uh, key staff are going to be here shortly to be able to 
speak more directly to this. So, you know, if we can just let Commissioner Franz uh, finish up, okay. if, or maybe is finished, I don't know. <laughs> If other members feel like they have to have him here to answer questions, he's kind of, uh, he's sort of addressing it ahead of time, I think. Uh, Commissioner France, uh, why don't you finish your testimony? I do have a couple people who want to ask, uh, representatives that want, need to ask you a quick question. Sure, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, just in, in closing on the governor's plan, then I'll talk about the, uh, the plan, the rebate plan in House File 1. The governor's plan is simple. So, it, so if James Smith receives an invoice stating that he owes $1,000 in insurance coverage for the month of February, under the governor's plan, the invoice would subtract 25% as premium relief on the invoice, and the amount that James Smith would pay would be $750. He would pay this reduced premium, and, and he would save $250 on his monthly premium. The state would then reimburse the plans for the amount of premiums that were reduced. That, it, it is that simple. And that's how we came up with the $302 million of relief. But what I want to do quickly before we go on is to provide some context for the mechanism in, in House File 1 and, and also in the Companion Senate File 1. And we've been working through this over the weekend to try to understand the implications and what it would, would require to set up. I think one of the things, the first thing is the bill allocates $8.5 million for administrative costs. But our analysis finds that $8.5 million is nowhere near the amount that we will need to implement House File 1. So the first thing we did was, well, what can we, where can we go? I mean, obviously, the, the challenge is if you can use existing systems, that's what you do. But what, one of the things we tried to do was what, what systems can we use? And the, <coughs> the first problem we realized is that the people that we want to interact with are in none of our systems. Uh, some of the people uh, would be in the Mincher system, and obviously some of the people are taxpayers, but there's no current system that has this particular set of people as their, their core group. So we looked to the integrated tax system at revenue. That cost $40 million in five years to set up. We looked at the statewide integrated financial system, cost $65 million, two years to implement. And we looked at Mensure, which cost over $200 million in IT cost. Ultimately, this, the premium relief process envisioned by House File 1 would require a number of components and while we have some of these processes in existing systems, these are processes that do not currently exist in the form described in the legislation, and they would have to be created for this one-time program. We believe that if the bill were passed in its current form, we would not be able to provide premium relief checks until January 2018 at the earliest. First thing to do is set up a web application. The bill requires that all uh, people who want to get premium relief have to file an application with MMB. Well, we don't have that system. We would have to develop a web-based system that would allow that to come in. It would contain confidential information, social security numbers, date of birth, family, family information, so it would obviously have to be very well protected. So then we, once we do that, then we have to also take a, have a residency check. We have to take that list of people, and then we have to go over to deed or revenue and develop an exchange, and tran, uh, an exchange system that would allow deed or revenue to verify whether these folks are residents or not. Then we're going to have to do the income verification. So we would need to develop an interface with the federal tax system. There are those that exist now, but this would be a different set of people operating under different rules. The Minshew, the Minshew process uses rules designated by the Affordable Care Act. These rules would be designated under House File 1 and would require a different set of rules. We would have to get approval from the IRS in order to access the federal tax system. Then we would have to do a health plan data cross-check. This requires us to go back to the plans to verify that the people who made an application to us to get a rebate actually paid the premium and for what period. So we'd have to get, once again, have social security number, family information. Any, and then any information system we develop has to interface with our financial transaction system because we're going to need either to cut a check for these folks, make a payment, or enroll them in a direct deposit system. They would need to be enrolled as vendors for the state because they would need to be paid and we don't have them listed in our system. So we also need to develop a rule engine. By that, by that I mean we'd have to have a data set that would help us determine how these rules apply. For example, uh, we, need to take, we need to design a program that would take the monthly information provided by the health insurance carriers for each applicant and apply the rules. For example, uh, we would have to make sure that every applicant is sorted into one of five categories under the, under the law. And then we'd have to determine to be eligible, they must receive assistance based on both their income and the time of the year because the credit changes over the course of the year. Let me give you one example. A family of two 
with a 2016 income of $97,000 would qualify for a 25% rebate for the first three months of 2017, but starting in April, they would receive a 20% benefit. On the other hand, a family of four with a 2016 income of $97,000 would qualify for a 25% rebate for the first three months of 2017 and a rebate of 30% starting in April. I'm a tax lawyer. This is complicated. Part of the reason for the governor's plan was so people could understand, I get a 25% rebate, I multiply that times my premium, I get it and, and I'll get it on the premium. We have to set up a fraud prevention process. Unlike the governor's plan where there's a, uh, the rebate is on the invoice, what happens there is someone is buying insurance. In the worst case scenario, they get cheaper insurance. Under the plan in House File 1, we're sending checks out to thousands of people every month. And when, once you start sending out checks, you have to have a verification process to make sure those payments are correct. We'd have to set up a system to recover ineligible payments. We'd have to do a reporting mechanism under 1095 and other tax forms. We'd have to develop an audit preparation process for the Office of Legislative Auditor if they do the auditing or whoever does the auditing. We would need employees to process the applications. We figured it would take about two hours from beginning to end for every application to be processed. That would take about uh, 200,000 hours of work if we had 100,000 applications. We think there could be more, but that's about equivalent, equivalent of 100 new employees. The 100 new employees, just rec that's just the application processing. It doesn't rec that doesn't deal with the work done in all the other agencies. In addition, if you're going to ask us to do this, we're going to need to do a request for a proposal. These are not the things that government does on a regular basis, and so we would we would do a request for a proposal. The timeline for that would about one to three months to develop it quicker if I work 24 seven instead of just 12 hours a day. It would require posting for about two months. It would require a scoring criteria another two months, the selection process, contract negotiations, and we think that's about a six month process. So what does this all mean? Let me just summarize and say what we think it means from our perspective and why the governor is ask, asking you to consider his proposal to make this work quicker. It means that Minnesotans now, today, already today, and the rest of this month will have to pay their full premiums without any relief. And it means they're not going to get any relief throughout the, the year until we get this system implemented. They would not see any premium relief in 2018. Our best case scenario is that the cost to develop the system is approximately $20 million. Now, we all know that if you do an IT project under a political deadline, that you're, you're guaranteeing problems. And so we want to set up a process that actually works. This process creates red tape and delays. Now, there may be some people who can afford to pay up front and wait for a rebate check, no matter what it is, and they'll be happy with that. But there are a lot of people who are, are waiting right now to decide whether to sign up by the end of enrollment on January 31st. The governor's proposal is ready to go. We would like to pass this premium relief bill as soon as possible, and we're happy to work with you to make some way so that we can get this through the legislative process. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take some questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Um, at this time, we have, <laughs> do have some additional questions. Uh, Representative Quam, did you have a question for the uh, Commissioner, or was yours to the bill in general? Well, my, my I was initially ready to ask a question to the amendment that I thought we were going to discuss, but uh, enlightened by the Commissioner's uh, uh, presentation, there are a few uh, clarifications that do come to mind, if that's appropriate. Sure. Go ahead, Rep. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, um, I, I was sort of surprised when you were talking about a process that actually works because I'm not aware of uh, the back end functioning, so I'm not sure you've got people that have been working on this for years that actually know how to generate a process that works. And uh, what has been done doesn't appear to be very transparent to the public or has... Uh, <laughs> improved accessibility and you talked about the governor's plan having fraud protection the OLA report seemed to indicate there wasn't a whole lot of uh, systems present in the existing process that detected fraud or take took care of it and it was around that magnitude of a billion dollars a year because the back end isn't functional and that was what you were indicating the back end needed to be um, 
you know, is why it's taking or would take so long. Um, it also appears that uh, you, you don't realize that the state knows who her citizens are, and the Rev Department of Revenue sure knows how to get a hold of me when I get a, a tax bill. So I don't understand why you have to define citizens as being vendors because the state has in the past, in much shorter time frame, actually delivered uh, rebate checks, I think it was during Jesse's term and, and et cetera. So I'm really concerned that you're stating a lot of problems, issues, and how things can't work. Frankly, this committee is trying really hard to come up with ways to get things to work because other states have been capable of actually doing the job of the citizens and providing the access in a timely fashion. So I'm disappointed that instead of debating the, the bills, debating the amendments that are coming forward and doing the people's work, we're hearing more reasons why we can't do this for the people in a timely fashion. And that's very disappointing. So, you know, continue to tell us how you can't do it. It's going to take, it'll be next year before you can do anything. And months and months, you know, frankly, in the real world, outside where our citizens work, they get stuff done in a timely fashion. And they know how to do it because, you know, we've got a lot of productivity things out there that have come around this century and even last century that we actually could emulate and give the service that our citizens deserve. <clears throat> so um, other than reminding Representative Liebling that uh, in your district and mine, the rates didn't start out low. They started out high, they increased, and they are still high, and that's part of the problem that we here should be addressing instead of coming up with excuses of why we can't do it for the citizens. Commissioner Frank. Mr. Chair, Representative, well, I take umbrage at your comments about the, the inability of the, the state to do certain things. In fact, I'm also confused by your remarks. At the beginning, if I understood you correctly, you were criticizing us for not being able to carry out certain difficult functions that were thrust upon us by the legislature. And now, you're, then later on, you're saying that we, we can't do anything and you, you're upset that we're not telling you we can do it in the next month. So I'm a little confused <laughs> about exactly what it is you're telling us. But what I'm saying is, if you're going to, if, if the House GOP plan is to develop an administrative nightmare and make us responsible for it, then I'm going to tell you how long it's going to take to develop that system, how much money it's going to take so that it runs and it runs exactly correctly. I was in the private sector for 30 years as a lawyer and as a business person. I know how the private sector works. And they get experts on the case. They do an RFP. They find out how much it costs. And that's exactly what we want to do. Uh. With that, the uh, Representative Baker has a question. No, pass. You'll pass? Uh, Representative Franson. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Franz, uh, first off, I just want to say Mincher is a huge administrative nightmare. Just lay that on the record. Um, so when we were told that policyholders, uh, committee members, would be saving $2,500 a year, or more in insurance premiums, never in my wildest lot on dreams did I ever think that this type of savings would um, have come from this type of redistribu redistribution of wealth. Uh, Commissioner, I don't know, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the governor, you are tied in with the governor's plan here and that you're very loyal to the governor. Members, I'm loyal to the people of my district first, the uh, district members of 8B. <coughs> and they want premium relief. But the perception that they have is that the legislature and the governor is pushing for hundreds of millions of dollars to be funneled to insurance companies so that they can continue to get richer off the backs of them. And I just have a question, if anybody here knows, maybe you, uh, Commissioner, how many, uh, what's the hundreds of millions of dollars in reserves that the insurance companies are sitting on? Mr. Franz. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, I don't know that, and I think uh, someone from C Commerce Department can maybe answer that. But let me clarify something. The governor's plan takes $312 million and puts it in the pockets of the people who live in your district. This plan has very minimal administrative costs. Almost all of it 
with the exception of about $300,000 we propose for a, an audit, goes to premium relief and it goes immediately. So if the people in your district want relief, the governor's plan will get it there faster and, and than any other program. Representative Franzen. Uh Commissioner, the people in my district also want reform. Representative, uh, Mr. But Chair, they want reform with the plan. They do not trust that the reform is going to come if we give millions of dollars to insurance companies. Rep uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, we are not giving millions of dollars to insurance companies. We are giving $312 million to Minnesotans for premium relief. And the governor is fully committed to reform. He's made it clear that the next step in this after we do the premium relief is to do reform for 2018. And we're ready to do that today. Uh, members, just to remind you, the uh, health care debate can go far afield. So let's keep our comments as much as possible directed to the bill's uh, provisions that are in front of us. With that, Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Franz, for being here today and uh, for your work in trying to provide premium relief to uh, struggling middle-class Minnesotans. Um, and we've been uh, chewing on this sep since September, um, and many of us were very uh, surprised uh, on October 1st uh, how bad things were and are and nobody is more aware of that than uh, people with bills right now and so um, I think the the um, the attempt to try to get relief into the hands of people is something that I know you want to do I know the governor wants to do and I know that the legislature wants to to try to get done and how do you do that it's obviously going to be very expensive and there's unintended consequences and I share Representative Franson's um, concerns uh, that we hear every day that we get emails about about making sure that this is not going to be fair it's not going to fix things 17 is a year to struggle through um, and I think we understand that but we want to make sure that it works and I think some of the frustrations that you're hearing is that the there have been other alternatives that have been put forward uh, but from the administration, I think from our end, the frustration has been that the only plan that is um, up for consideration is the governor's premium relief plan, which I think has some issues to it as well, just in terms of implementation. Um, I just point out that there will be costs associated with um, doing your plan uh, that the insurance companies are going to bear, and they're going to pass that along to the uh, policy holders uh, that we're asking them to do and turn around extremely quickly that they have IT people and they have people to add and and the same sorts of issues that you're raising about uh, the proposal that's before you um, and you know I, I think that um, that the frustration that uh, representative Quam expressed is is uh, spot-on uh, that um, you know, it seems like the average person sitting out there is saying that if you're going to return $300 million to people, that it ought not take six months and $20 million and lots of excuses, uh, that we should be able to figure that out through MMB. And, um, and so I, I think that that, you know, w when we're looking at trying to make this thing work, that that, that ought to play into that. My question is very simple. Uh, Commissioner, is there anything other than the governor's plan that you think that you can do? Commissioner Franz? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, no, I appreciate the question. Uh, I think that, uh, but this kind of goes back to the September, October time frame, and, and this is, uh, we didn't just come up with this at the, at the last minute. We, we struggled with the same issues you're all struggling with, and I get that, and, and that's why uh, to Representative Franson's concerns. That's why we want the plans to do something. We want them to participate. We all think, agree, that the plans can do more and should do more to help out in the market, and we get that. And that's what we struggled with in October. I mean, we met with the plans, and we met with uh, people who were experiencing this problem. We tried to come up with a way that would, you know, have a, an income limit. We found out there was just no way to implement an income limitation that would give relief to people early in 2017. We, you know, people talked about having a tax credit. 
well, tax credit's a wonderful thing. Uh, could you just add it to the, to the tax scheme? But then the relief doesn't come until 2018, right? So the whole problem with struggling with these issues, and there are a lot of hard issues. We understand that. We get that. But struggling with these issues and working on this stuff, we the best thing that we could come up with was the, 20, the flat 25% rebate or subsidy program for all those people in the, in the individual market. We know it's not a perfect solution. We understand the, the limitations, but we think that the overall advantage of paying early and right away and the simplicity outweigh everything else. So I don't today have another plan, Representative, and I'm happy to talk more about, about that as we walk, walk through this process. We're not saying it's our way or the highway. That's not the intent of what we're trying to say is this is the best we could come up with. We think it's effective. We think it, 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 it's, it's and it's cost effective and it's quick. And if someone's got a better idea, tell me and we'll, you know, I'll take it to the governor. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. And, and uh, um, I think, uh, um, you know, there, there are viable alternatives to the governor's plan out there. And I, I certainly hope that you keep an open mind about that. The, the short answer that I heard back from you is no, uh, that there's not another. Um, uh, alternative that is that we're serious about yet um, but uh, you know from uh, from the standpoint of just trying to get relief to people um, that I think the plan that you have before uh, that we have before us with working at 3MMB is viable and um, it's not going to take six or eight months it's not going to take 20 million dollars so I think we need to sharpen our pencils and get a little bit more serious about trying to provide relief to people um, in, in, in a political environment that this is just something that can't be political and we just got to get, we got to get this figured out. Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy New Year's. Welcome back. So um, here we are today when we're speaking about health care, which is really, really important. Um, <laughs> You know, it is, you know, health care and affordability of health care really impacts a, a lot of families, a lot of children, you know, a, a lot of people. And, um, you know, a few years back we created Minsure because we was under this obligation from the federal government to do something or they were going to come in and do something for us. And we really felt that, you know, we knew better what the families in Minnesota needed than the federal government. So we created a process that will help families and give families some relief so that they can go to the hospital, that, so that they can take care of their medical needs. For those who are suffering from cancer and diabetes or whatever it may be, that they will be able to do that. And so here we are today where premiums are for some working class, middle class families, and it's unaffordable. And they're screaming at us to give them some relief so they, they can have coverage. They are begging us. And I remember in early October, um, um, our Speaker of the House coming out and saying to the governor, you know, we're going to impeach you if you don't do something and do something now. You know, and this isn't coming upon us here in this legislative body and the majority to bring forth to the people of Minnesota some relief because they deserve that. They deserve to have coverage that they can afford. They deserve to be able to go to a doctor and have their health care needs taken care of. And we owe that to the families of the state of Minnesota. Yes, we want to stabilize the market in, 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 in 2018, but that's 2018. Families are asking for relief now in 2017. And so what I hear, I think what I'm hearing from the Republicans is that it costs too much. We don't want to give them a relief. We don't want to help families because, you know, maybe MMB or someone else can figure out how to make this happen. I think, you know, the majority got to figure out how to make this happen. And we got to give people the relief that they've been asking for. Um, and, you know, I, I know in my district, I, I talked to a, a young father, working father, you know, who was not able to find or afford coverage on Minshew from himself and his wife. He has cancer. He has cancer. He has stage four cancer and said to me that I had to put off my treatment. And I was like, wow. 
he had to put off his treatment in stage four cancer because he could not afford coverage. And so as we sit here today uh, <clears throat> in this bill, in this committee, which I knew for sure that we were coming to this body trying to give some relief to families, we want to stabilize the market in 2018. And I say we can do better. I say we're adding to the bureaucracy in a huge way with this plan. And it does nothing to help people now. And that is what they're asking for. So I hope as we go through this process early enough that we come out with some type of solution that's going to reach real people's lives in real time. Because health of a baby, a child, a mother, or a father is crucial. And so we as the legislative body need to find a way to make this work for the Minnesota families. And I hope that we can step back a little bit, you know, and say, yeah, stabilizing the market in 2018 is important, but how do we stabilize families in 2017 is what we need to do and think about that. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Commissioner Chair Franz has uh, graced us for over an hour uh, now um, in this committee room and he loves our committee. He's just telling me how much he uh, appreciates being in front of us. But he does have other uh, commitments um, at this time and so I don't know who else is on the list but um, if there are anything, if there's anything, I'd like to help him get along. He's Okay, let's try to, we have two me. more on the list and, and uh, we won't add any additional. Okay? Uh, if you could make it uh, very quickly, Representative Olson. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. I will be brief. Um, newly elected here, and within my first 48 hours of being sworn into office, I had my phone calls from my district were about this. Were people that were scared, that needed premium relief, that said what they saw from the governor's office that had been out was, was something that they really were hopeful and really asked me to look into um, seriously. So I, I want to talk about premium relief. I think we do need to talk about reform, but I think we need to be strategic about how we do that in that we're thoughtful and mindful and that relief is really what people are asking for right now. And so I just have two quick questions for you, Commissioner. One, um, in terms of relief now, I hear you say that the governor's plan is easier to implement relief now. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, yes. Rep Commissioner Fran. In terms of the timeline on the GOP plan for relief, would that take longer than what the governor's plan is? Mr. Fine. Mr. Chair, Representative, yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, next is Representative Grisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just have two quick questions for uh, Commissioner Franz. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Chair, the first one is um, we've heard two different things here, and they seem to be um, juxtaposed, and that is the sense of urgency and the sense for reform. Um, and I'd like to know what the governor's position is. Is it right out of the gate? Is it a sense of urgency for relief, or is it a sense of reform that should happen first? Commissioner France. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, well, clearly we think the relief has to come immediately and the reform can follow shortly thereafter. Representative Fisher. And so thank you for that. And so urgency and getting relief. So I've heard um, in the committee today that we need to do this, but oh, wait, slow down, we need to reform. Wait, we need to do this, we need to slow down, we need to reform. So my question is, What's the best approach and has the governor's office talked to the DFL caucus to get on the same page with this? Because it seems like we're at odds here. What are we going to do? Commissioner Frank. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, well, we've, been, we've been talking to anyone who will listen to us. Uh, we're open in that regard. We've, we were talking, and as Representative Dean knows, we were talking throughout the fall, and we've been talking this session, and we're talking with uh, you know, all, the, all the caucuses that will listen to us, and uh, we're just hoping everyone will <clears throat> come together and realize that if we do this right, we can do it right away and provide immediate relief. Thank you. So just... Uh, Representative Krishna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I appreciate that because I think that's good advice for all of us. And the last thing I would just ask, uh, Mr. Chair, when did the governor's office know about this? We heard about in October that uh, the governor's office started putting a plan together. But I suspect with negotiations, was it possible that the governor's office knew the situation was going to arrive much earlier? Commissioner Brandt. Uh, Rep, uh, Mr. Ch Chair, Representative, well, clearly that we knew that there were market conditions, and Commissioner Rothman can talk about what happened, what what the process was in 2016. We knew that the market conditions were dire, and he worked hard to make sure we we kept the individual market in place. 
but it wasn't until after they were released that we really figured out, you know, until the plans came out that we knew what the scope of the problem was, and that's why we started working in October to come up with a relief plan. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think that concludes the qu questions. We want to thank you for your testimony, Commissioner no, Pence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I really I don't know how long you can stay. I know you're double, triple, and no, I'm going to I'm going to leave right now. But I I'm really happy. I really wanted to come here today, this morning, and be a part of this. And I thank you for for being respectful of my time and letting me come here and t a little bit out of order. I appreciate that. And we really need to get this done. The governor wants to get it done, and that's why I'm here. That's why we're talking with you is to try to get this thing done. Thank you. And you, Commissioner, you know legislation is a process. So st uh, please stay involved. Okay. We do value your input. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, the other thing before we move to the amendment, uh, you should have gotten a new DE1 amendment. There was a duplicate <coughs> on there. Anybody who didn't, uh, just let staff know and they'll get you one. Uh, the other thing I just say is that I think everybody on both sides of the aisle wants to address these concerns. You know, people are hurting. This is a critical area out there. Uh, it's how we address those concerns. Uh, short term and long term with reform is really what we're talking about here today. So thank you. With that, uh, Representative Liebling, do you want to move your amendment? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, Commissioner Rothman was here as well. And I think, I don't know, I can't see him, but I hope, hope he's still here. And I know he was uh, stuck in the weather for a while. But, um, you know, uh, if the chair would would wish, I mean, he's the he's the guy who can probably speak to the bill that's before the committee before we actually move the amendment, if that would be okay. Yeah, Commissioner Rothman, would you like to come forward and make a few comments? And and Mr. Chair, if I could kind of repeat the question that I had asked Rep. Chair Rep. Schumacher before, and maybe I could start out by asking that of Commissioner Rothman, unless he mm -hmm. has some prepared remarks he wants to make. Commissioner, before you were here, I had asked Chair Schumacher what this, uh, I'm sure you've seen the, um, the the clone bill of House File 1, the pieces that are before this committee, and it's, it's not the whole thing, but, um, and, and maybe you don't know which pieces they are, but I had asked uh, Chair Schumacher what this bill does to stabilize the market in 2018. How does the bill actually do that? And Frankly, I didn't get a really satisfactory answer to that, and um, so I don't know if you had prepared remarks, but I guess I would I would like to know your opinion of whether the bill before us actually does that. Mr. Rothman, during your remarks, do you want to address that question and the other remarks you wanted to make? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling. First of all, thank you for having me here this morning. It's an incredibly important, critical, and urgent topic to be talking about. I do have prepared remarks, um, and in my remarks, I will address the question, but I would address it immediately and just answer your question that in my view, um, as you'll hear from me, the, it's imperative that we get rebate relief immediately. Rebate relief should have happened months ago, and <clears throat> every day that goes by, is going is a destabilizing <coughs> factor in the current 2017 market. Every day that goes by means that the market on January 30, at the end of the month, will be less stable and in more critical condition than it is or was before. So rate relief is the most important relief that can happen for 2017, and it should be done immediately. Um, and that, <clears throat> that reform or any reforms for 2018 should be worked on also immediately so that we can get things done, but, but should wait and should be vetted. So let me, let me go through my comments and explain uh, where we are and how we got here. Um, as you heard from Commissioner Franz, although I wasn't here, we did talk, and I'm sure he explained that Article 1 creates a number of problems for consumers as it's proposed. Its delivery of premium assistance is slow, expensive, and complicated. The bottom line is the governor's plan is already vetted, has been for months, and can be quickly and easily administered by the health plans in order to get premium relief into the hands of consumers immediately. At a very high level, the most important thing that can be done for the individual market in both 2017 and 2018 is to pass immediate premium relief so consumers receive a 25% discount on their bills. 
This is what the governor's plan does. Now, as I said on September 30th, when we released rates publicly, when Blue Cross, Shield, when Blue Cross and Blue Shield left the market this last summer, all of the other plans were prepared to and reluctantly to follow suit. The 2017 individual market was like a patient wheeled into an emergency room with no pulse. It was on the verge of collapse. The department, our staff uh, who are here, mm -hmm. worked diligently with every single health plan. I worked with every CEO. And we worked out a solution for 2017 so that they would stay in the individual market. They would propose plans. And you've heard some of those things. I can go into the details. But the bottom line is that when the patient was wheeled into the emergency room, it had no pulse. We had to resuscitate the patient. So we have a market in 2017 for thousands, tens of thousands of people. We are still in the emergency room. Let me say that again. We're still in the emergency room. And before we can talk about how the market is going to walk again in 2018 up in the operating room, we need to finish stabilizing the patient by infusing premium relief to consumers. This must happen as soon as possible. We are now only 21 days or so before the end of the marketplace. I haven't checked the calendar, but with a stable market in 2017, we will then be able to work on the stabilizing effects or stabilizing the things we need for 2018. Now, as I've called for two years, we must have conversations about bringing future stability to the individual market in 2018. I know a question was asked earlier, well, when do we know? If you remember, in October of 2015, when I talked about the individual market, I said we need to have mechanisms in place to stabilize the marketplace. Now, Article 2 to, does, does not do what it needs to, do, needs to do in order to stabilize the rates for 2017, and it doesn't address the core problems with the individual market for 2018. Included in Article 2 provisions are things like a stop-loss provision that's been debated in this House for many years, but it has no effect. It doesn't have, in fact, it has an, it, it, the opposite effect on helping the individual market. They won't bring down Minnesota's individual premiums one cent. Let me reiterate that. The Article 2 proposals are not focused on the specific problems of the individual market. It may, we don't believe it will bring the stabilizing effect to 2018. And I'm happy to discuss the, each of the provisions in Article 2 of the, in the bill in detail. But again, I urge you to separate them and take up the governor's proposal to provide immediate premium relief to all Minnesotans currently taking the full force of the insurance company's rate increases. Now, I'm happy to go through Article 2 and explain provision by provision. Okay. Let me just comment highly. I've opened myself up to questions if you want. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Quickly, if possible. Section 1 talks about a, moving the date uh, public filings earlier. Whether they get uh, publicly filed or publicly uh, uh, available earlier will not affect the rates whatsoever. It wouldn't have had an effect on or wouldn't have helped at all with the situation last summer. Article 2, sections 2 to 3, we have talked about this is the stop loss provision. Again, it will provide zero premium assistance to Minnesotans right now who buy their own insurance and will not help stabilize the individual market going forward. On its merits, the proposal picks winners and losers among small businesses in your districts. It undermines consumer protections that have been in place in Minnesota for a long time and under the ACA. Our, we will be out of compliance with the Insurance Commissioner's Model Act throughout the country and actuarial recommendations in this area. Now, many states have looked at this. Maryland issued a comprehensive report on October 3rd, 2016, and here's what they said. They note that since, that since the NEIC last studied the issue in 2015, now the NEIC is the Insurance Commissioner's organization bipartisan throughout the country. 
Red and blue state legislatures have done the opposite of this proposal, the opposite. <clears throat> California increased its individual attachment point to 40,000, Colorado to 20, DC to 40,000, Maryland to 22,500, New Jersey to 25,000. The reason why states are adjusting the attachment, to, attachment point upward is due to the rise in health care costs since the last time the NEIC proposed this model act. It does destabilize consumer protections. Section four through nine eliminate the not for profit requirement for HMOs to sell in Minnesota's health insurance mar market, allowing for profit HMOs <coughs> to exist. I can't reiterate enough that the tradition of Minnesota, the Minnesota's uh, a marketplace for HMOs, has been to require it be a non profit <coughs> uh, marketplace. It doesn't make any sense to make profits off of the individuals in this marketplace, first of all. And second of all, it will not, it does not. What, I would, I would ask the insurance plans that are here, or any for-profit company, when they look at the individual marketplace, are they enticed any more than Blue Cross was or the other, individual, other health plans who were on the precipice of leaving the, this marketplace more so? In fact, when you look around the country, United Healthcare told many, many, all the states, we don't even want to participate in the individual market. So, for, so frankly, I don't know how this works. I really don't. Commissioner, if you could uh, wrap up your comments, I will. please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Section 10 allows carriers to sell individual market plans under the 21st Century Cures Act. Now, this one we'll look into. We'll take a look. We're looking at it more closely. And it may be worthy of future discussions. I do want to say that. But we should not wait to figure out the details to pass this while we need premium relief immediately. Sections 11 and 12 deal with balance and surprise billing provisions. I've publicly said that this is a serious problem. It is a serious problem, <coughs> but it doesn't help in the individual market premium relief. It doesn't stabilize the marketplace in the short term. Now, I know MDA, the Department of Health is here, and, uh, and I know they've looked at it, but at a high level, the two sections themselves don't even seem to work in conjunction. Section 13 is a revised continuity of care concept for only 2017, and it doesn't affect the marketplace going forward. Establishing continuity of care requirements prospectively so that an insurer leaving all or part of Minnesota must take into their financial calculus taking care of their sickest patients for 120 days makes sense. Establishing them looking back, however, may have significant cost implications for consumers who would be left holding the bag by insurers who do not consider these costs, who did not consider these costs when they proposed their plans to us and are now selling them in the marketplace. In fact, a lawyer would say, you're gonna jump in and rewrite their contracts. Now in section 15, uh, given the time frame for reporting, these are minor provisions, but we would conduct these studies, report to the legislature. But again, when we look at it, we would like to see immediate relief right now. And I'll just say it this way, Mr. Chair, and wrap up my comments. When the governor proposed immediate premium relief and figured out a way to get it into the consumers, uh, into their bills, meaning it would immediately reduce the amount charged to them by 25%, they don't have to pay it. That will infuse, like uh, blood infusion, critical dollars into the marketplace so that people can choose now. And what does that mean? It means that <clears throat> they will buy into the individual market, it will stabilize it, and just to be out, to make sure this is understood, the individual market right now, again, is on life support. We will see what the numbers look like in the next few days or when it comes out in the marketplace, but it will have shrunk, it will have shrunk, it will shrink, and we need to make sure that it expands. So getting that relief is critical. And then finally, Mr. Chair, I would say this, um, as the governor said, and as Commissioner France said, that's the most important thing right now. We will work on trying to fix or the longer term reform for 2018. We're here to have that conversation, talk with everybody, work out solutions to how that will happen. And again, my comments stand on Article 2 and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Rothman. Uh, I'll let members digest that, but I think we uh, since his comments referred a lot to uh, the amendment, I think we can have 
uh, entertain the amendment and uh, have that discussion around there. I hope you will stay uh, here in the committee room so you're available for questions. Uh, Representative Liebling. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I would like to move the DE1 amendment. The DE1 amendment is um, two, two pieces. One is the um, what became House File 67, I think, which was the, uh, the plan that the commissioner has been talking about that the administration worked out and that we have been discussing at least since October. Um, this plan, as the commissioner said, gives an immediate or, you know, soon 25% discount to uh, people who are buying insurance in the individual market but who are not getting a tax subsidy. So um, these are the people who have been letting us know that they absolutely cannot afford to buy their individual insurance for 2017 unless they get some help. So this is relief that goes to people. And I know it's been said a couple times, oh, it's going to insurance companies. It's not. It's coming off people's invoices. There will be a 25% discount on the invoice. And then the money that supposedly goes to insurance companies just, just pays that back. So in terms of the consumer, there's no red tape. There's just a bill that says, here's what it would cost, and here's your 25% discount for 2017 on each of the bills. So this is relief that goes to people. It would do, as Commissioner Rothman is, has said very clearly, help stabilize the market for 2017, which is very, very important. And even if the rebate cannot be given immediately, when we pass this bill, people will know what they will be getting. There won't be any confusion whether they're eligible for it or how much it will be. Most people can subtract 25% from their bill and know what they're ultimately going to be paying. And the hope is that that will encourage them to continue to purchase insurance for 2017. That's why the market will be stabilized. The other piece that's in the DE1 amendment is this, um, con what we've been calling the continuity of care piece. Because DFLers also believe, and I think I heard Commissioner Rothman say that, you know, this is an important issue. And um, having a large insurer drop out of the market um, was really did, you know, um, throw a lot of consumers into turmoil. Um, so we all are very concerned about those people who may be undergoing a course of treatment, who for whom switching provider is a real problem. And so we've included that provision in this DE1 amendment. There's also in the amendment the $15 million appropriation, which is uh, to backfill to pay for, the, for this uh, care. These costs, I think Commissioner Rothman referred to the fact that the insurance companies would be asked to pay for costs they didn't anticipate when they put out their contracts. But indeed, the, um, this DE1 amendment pays for those costs. So it has the state pick up those costs to reimburse the companies, again, for costs that they incur by letting somebody stay in a, with a provider that's not in the network. So um, that is the gist of the amendment. Mr. Chair, we believe that this is really urgent. Um, as I think the Commissioner said it in a very compelling way, the patient is in the emergency room still, and we need to do this infusion so that we have a chance, you know, not that the rest of the, you know, we, some of the rest of these um, provisions that are in the bill, which the uh, DE1 amendment, of course, you know, for the public, the DE1 amendment would replace the current bill. It would become the bill. So it would take out some of these, these other reforms uh, or these other changes that are in, in this bill. <coughs> there is time to talk about these changes. It doesn't have to be rushed through. It doesn't have to be done with several committees all hearing the same bill in one day. There is enough time for us to consider these in a thoughtful way and to think about and put forward other ways to stabilize the 2018 market. But the real critical piece is twofold. First of all, it's the rebate that the commissioners talked about so compellingly. And secondly, we believe that it makes sense to do this continuity of care piece. And uh, Mr. Chair, I would also like a roll call on the amendment. Roll call has been requested. Representative Dean. <coughs> My questions are for uh, Commissioner Rothman. I'll wait till he comes back. Okay. Uh, questions for the author of the uh, amendment? Uh, uh, 
Chair Schumacher, any comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, Representative Liebling's offering uh, the amendment here today and uh, the different perspective that we have there. I'm, I'm glad to see that the continuity of care provision made it into uh, this um, idea pattern that we have here today. But uh, I, I think uh, Representative Liebling also made the point on why we need to vote against it today and that it does take out a lot of the other reforms that are in House File 99. And so I would ask you to vote no. Uh, any other questions? I would just say, too, just uh, giving money to individuals, which is critically necessary at this point, I agree with, uh, is good. But just believing that that's going to stabilize the market with the insurance companies without any type of reforms, uh, I think, is uh, misdirected. So uh, with that, uh, staff would take the roll. Uh, Representative Schumacher? No. Representative Grunhagen? No. Representative Liebling? Yes. Representative Albright? No. Representative Allen? Yes. Representative Baker? No. Representative Dean? No. Nope. Representative Flanagan? Yes. Representative Franson? No. Representative Freiberg? Yes. Representative Keel? No, that's not the chair. Representative Kegel? No. Yes. Representative Kresha? No. <laughs> Representative Lomer? No. Representative McDonald? No. Representative Moran? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Olson? Yes. Representative Peterson? No. Representative Quam? Yes. Representative Stansted? Yes. Representative Tice? No. Vote on the amendment is 13 nays and 9 ayes, so the amendment fails. Now we'll take the next amendment, which is the DE2 <coughs> amendment. Uh, who's offering this amendment? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. On Sunday, I uh, was invited to participate in a town hall meeting of sorts in West St. Paul. And uh, the topic that we talked about the most was health care. And there was an individual there who had been a chemist for all of his career and had a genetic mutation. Uh, and so he's on a medication now to balance that mutation in his blood. Um, and it's costing him out of pocket $1,400 a month. His issue doesn't have anything to do with the individual market. He's retired. He's in Medicare. Um, I talked to a, a person who is in the individual market. I talked to another person who's a small business owner with large deductibles and high rates of increase, also not in the individual market. We have had, um, in my tenure in the legislature, a number of years where we worked together, not necessarily um, like kumbaya together, but we worked together in 2008, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, to do hard health care reform. And it took a full session and it took work in the interim, but we did it. And then in 2010, we broke up. And we have been arguing mostly from partisan and ideological perspectives on health care. And we haven't been listening very much to each other. And when you've been in charge, the Republicans, you've moved things. And when we've been in charge, we've moved things and we haven't listened to each other very well. And we're hearing, I think this morning, a lot of caution. I'm coming from the administration about some of the ideas in Representative Schumacher's bill. And I came prepared to offer this amendment that takes the, the immediate relief, the three months of immediate relief that is proposed in your bill, um, thinking that if we can't get our heads wrapped around what Governor Dayton is proposing, then at least we should do three months of relief so the people who are impacted by the, the changes in the individual market get some relief while we work on reform. Uh, but listening to Commissioner Franz this morning gave me a lot of concern about that because even for three months there's going to be a fairly significant investment of public dollars in a bureaucracy that is temporary in nature. And that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't seem fiscally wise to me. Um, and so I will say to you that you have the votes to pass Representative Schumacher's bill today. I don't think it is the right course for us, but I also don't think this amendment is the right course for us either after listening um, to the discussion that we've heard today. The people that I met with on Sunday were actually, they were urging our help. They were urging our hard work and they actually have faith in us. 
which we haven't heard very much of, or maybe you have, but I haven't. I haven't heard a lot of, we have faith in your ability to get this work done, but they want relief and they have faith in us. And I think that the step we're taking this morning in not listening carefully to the cautions that we're getting from the administration means the relief that we want so badly for Minnesotans isn't gonna be delivered in a timely fashion like it should be. So I'm gonna withdraw my amendment. Thank you very much. Representative uh, uh, Murphy withdraws the amendment. With that, uh, we are to the bill, and we have several testifiers here uh, that we want to get to. I will call on uh, Minnesota Medical Association, Dave Renner. Please, uh, we have 15 minutes left. If you could keep your comments to uh, two minutes or less, it would appreciate it. <laughs> and, and Mr. Chair, just briefly, is it, is it your intention that we vote on this bill this morning? Yes. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I would like to request a roll call when we do vote on the bill. Roll call has been requested <laughs> on the bill at the time of vote. Testimony. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair and members, uh, my name is Dave Renner. Uh, here today I'm representing the Minnesota Medical Association. Uh, Minnesota Medical Association is a uh, volunteer professional association representing over 10,000 physicians, physicians in training, and medical students. Also today I'm speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Radiological Society, the Minnesota Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, Minnesota Pain Society of Pain Physicians and the Minnesota Orthopedics Society. Um, I commend your work. You're all trying to do what what needs to be done to address the massive uh, increases. Um, and I know there are differences in opinion how to do that. I'm not here today to talk on that issue. I really want to focus on what's now sections 9 and 10 of this legislation. Um, first of all, I would encourage you to, uh, while you want to move quickly, um, have deliberate discussion because there are some many things in this bill that, that have not had a lot of discussion. But as physicians and physician groups, um, we are strongly opposed to the language in 9 and 10. Um, this is, as we understand the intent, this is to try to protect consumers or patients from unexpected bills uh, they receive when they, re when they re receive care from providers who are outside of networks. We agree that, that these are very narrow situations and that we need to do something to protect consumers. However, as the bill is drafted currently, um, we think, first of all, it's confusing, but also we believe this language will have a dramatic impact on small, independent rural practices and their ability to, to negotiate with health plans, whether they are included in a network or not included in a network. The way it's drafted right now, as we read this, it would require a provider who does not have a contract with a health plan, for whatever reason, to accept the discounted in-network rate as payment in full to mandate that a practitioner who has not signed a contract to accept the, the payment rate is simply not fair. In today's healthcare market, there are many reasons why practitioners may or may not be in a healthcare network. In some cases, it's the health plan has chosen not to invite them. We're moving more and more to narrow networks. Um, some practitioners who want to get in networks cannot get in the network, so they may not be invited to be participating. In some cases, it's a contract that's unworkable to the practitioner and they've chosen not to participate. In some Could cases, there aren't enough. Mr. Ringer. Um, so we are concerned that the language that you have in the bill right now will um, set a payment rate artificially that may not be workable for many clinics and may have a significant impact on the clinic's ability to continue to practice and will result in moving more and more to narrow networks, more and more practitioners not included in networks. Um, I could go on uh, about the concerns, but I, in, uh, to uh, respect your time, we have been working with Representative Hoppy and his staff. Uh, we continue to have conversations. We think what you're trying to address here is a problem that's not that big of a problem in Minnesota, but clearly when it happens, a patient uh, has uh, significant concerns. Um, if there are ways that we can continue to work with the authors and try to address this to protect the patient without having undue shift to the balance of that negotiation, we will try to do so. Uh, there are some national databases that some states have looked to in this area that look at uh, trying to have a justified rate, and we would encourage you to try to look with that. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, and as I say, we look forward to continuing to work and discuss and hopefully try to find a solution to this problem. Hey, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Renner. I think we'll take testimony from each of the testifiers and then questions, and uh, so members can write down their questions and recall any testifiers back to the desk. At this time, I think it's time we hear from somebody in the public, uh, a dairy farmer from Franklin, Jim Kahn. Next on deck, if somebody wants to come down already, we'll hear from uh, uh, the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce Health Director, 
Bentley Graves would be next if he wants to come down and. Uh, Jim, uh, go ahead and give your testimony. Good morning. Introduce yourself and yeah. and uh, for the committee and give your testimony. If you can keep it brief, two to three minutes. Yeah. Good morning. I'm James Connie. I'm a dairy farmer, and I come to you this morning because I come from an area in the state that is being impacted by this much more than what, say, the metro area is, in that when I talk to people out in our area, we're talking to small business people, whether they be farmers, whether they be people that are dealing with providing services, and they have individual plans. Statewide, you're talking 5%. Out in our area, it's more like 25%. So to my people in our area, this is critically important, and we need help now. My policy this, this year cost me $1,040 a month. Now, I got relief through Minsure, but a lot of my friends do not because they're over the limit. They're over the cliff. And once they're over the cliff, they're looking at policies that are costing them for a family over $20,000 a year. And they say, well, they're over 55000 but they're making, say, 70,000, they're costing 20,000. Look at the percentage of their income that they're putting out for health insurance. And I'm asking you for relief now for these people rather than trying to look at reform and relief in the same package. Because things like trying to change the whole game at once is not going to work. We need the relief for the people out there now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from uh, Bentley Graves, Director of Healthcare, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Introduce Chairman. yourself and give your testimony. Two to three minutes at most, please. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm the Director of Healthcare and Transportation Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And, and just for the record as well, the Minnesota Chamber uh, represents 2,300 businesses across the state of all sizes, of all industries, um, in all corners of the state. Um, typically, folks don't think of the business community of having, as having much interest in what goes on in the individual market, but as you just heard uh, from the previous testifier, you know, this is where both self-employed individuals go for insurance, um, and increasingly it's also where a lot of small employers um, have had to um, send their employees uh, with some kind of defined contribution arrangement. So um, we want to thank the legislature for their quick action on the overarching bill to bring premium relief to folks in the 2017 uh, calendar year. Um, and also the efforts to bring additional reforms around the individual market uh, to help stabilize it and make sure that uh, we have a, a functioning market going forward. Specifically, I want to I want to thank the legislature, and, uh, Chair Hoppe and, and Chair Schumacher, for including in this House File 99 and in the larger bill, uh, Section 8, regarding uh, bringing Minnesota law into conformity with federal law around uh, the newly available option for small employers to do pre-tax defined contribution arrangements for their employees. Um, as you may or may not know, over the last two years, the small group market has shrunk by roughly a third. Um, those employers have been struggling to find options for themselves and their employees. Um, up until Congress acted about a month ago, um, a lot of them were going the way of after-tax defined contribution arrangements, which required both them and their employees to pay premium for that coverage. Um, this action by Congress will level the playing field and allow them and their employees again to, to see this benefit on a pre-tax basis. Um, but there are some things we need to do in Minnesota law to make sure that Minnesota employers can take advantage of that. And I appreciate the fact, we appreciate the fact that this was included in the legislation. So thank you. Thank you for your quick action. I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and in that provision, the Section 8 provision, I, I just want for clarification, that was in the tax conformity bill that we've already passed, wasn't it? I believe so. Staff, any comments? Well, that's Mr. double goodness, Mr. Chair. It, 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 um, and Representative, it was on the on the on the tax side. This is more on the on the uh, the kind of the regulatory side of insurance. So it it, it kind of takes both to to make sure employers in Minnesota are, are good to go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Twyla Braze, uh, President, of Citizens Council of Healthcare. <coughs> If she's here, come forward. She's not here. Uh, uh, Ms. Karen Lom from the American Cancer Society. Wow, the 
if you'd please come forward, state your name, and introduce yourself to the committee, and try to keep your testimony to two to three minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for making health insurance a priority right at the beginning of this new legislative session. Uh, my name is Karen Laum. I'm a volunteer with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I'm a small business owner, and I'm one of the Minnesotans who is dealing with the issues we've been talking about today. I buy my health insurance on the individual care market. I am also a, a seven-year cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2009. I was young, 35 years old at the time, and thought I was healthy. That year, my doctor felt a lump in my neck during my annual exam and recommended that I get it checked out. I didn't at first, but she persisted. After some scans and biopsies, I was shocked to get a diagnosis of thyroid cancer that had spread to my lymph nodes. Just two weeks later, I was at the Mayo Clinic, uh, flat on my back, having major surgery, and my whole life changed. At the time of this diagnosis, I was working full-time and had great employer-based health coverage. As a cancer survivor, I now had the dreaded pre-existing condition. I was looking at three more decades of working years, and I was quite worried about what would happen to me if I lost my job and my insurance. But then right around this time, the Affordable Care Act became law, which provided an important safety net for me. I could no longer be denied coverage uh, due to being a cancer survivor, and I wasn't tethered to an employer for coverage. This enabled me in 2015 to step away from my um, job at the University of Minnesota and move to a new challenge. I went into business for myself as a public health consultant. 2016 was the first year I purchased health insurance on the individual market. I decided to buy insurance directly from Medica and forego Minsure because I earned just a bit too much to qualify for subsidies. I found a monthly uh, plan with a monthly premium of $370. I got to keep seeing all my doctors, which was very important to me. I learned that the plan that I had had through my employer was not an option for individuals um, in the individual health insurance market. It wasn't as good overall as my employer-based plan, but it worked okay for me. Uh, I cannot say the same for 2017. The plan I was on in 2016 has been dropped for 2017. As you know, the plan networks were scaled way back. Um, coverage has been scaled back, and I'm losing access to all but one of my doctors, including the primary care physician who coordinated my care for 14 years and other doctors I know and trust and respect. And honestly, I cried when I got the news. Um, Thank God the one doctor I can keep seeing as in-network is my endocrinologist, who is critically important to my thyroid cancer survivorship care. So for 2017, I picked the best available um, plan, and it was a 50% increase in premiums over 2016 rates. Um, it might not sound like a lot of money, but it, it really is to me. Um, I worry that this year will be the last I can be a small business owner because I, I can't continue to face this level of uncertainty with regard to finances and health coverage. And I really worry what 2018 will look like for me. Uh, it's frustrating to be paying so much more for coverage um, and to get care that's greatly inferior compared to what's available to people in employer-based plans. As a cancer survivor, I can tell you it's no trivial matter to lose access to your doctors and most of the networks in the Twin Cities, including Alina, which is everywhere, they've taken over everything, and was my network until January 1st of this year. Um, and there are no options available to the individual market um, consumer in the, uh, with the exception of the southeastern part of the state that has Mayo Clinic as in-network. I've been cancer-free for seven years, and given my present limited coverage, I fervently hope it stays that way. I am certain I would head straight to Mayo and risk financial ruin for the sake of care I trust. Uh, my top priority right now is addressing my high monthly insurance premiums. Uh, this bill would help make insurance more affordable for people like me. Uh, however, as we've been hearing today, uh, there are many other issues to work through, and I certainly recognize that. This is complicated work. Um, there are no easy answers. I'm hopeful that you will continue to work through those as well for the people of Minnesota, and I really appreciate you trying, and um, that you're bringing bills forward that would bring relief to people in my situation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and I think... Uh Ms. Lam, uh, that your testimony summarized what we're all here trying to solve today. Okay, so we will do our best to address that. Uh, we just have one more testifier, and then we'll take questions from members. Uh, and you can recall a testifier up here. It's uh, Mr. Paul Subazinski, Land Stewardship Project. Is he here? Keep, keep your testimony just a couple minutes. By the way, members, we can stay 
There's no committee meeting after here. We can stay a little bit after 10, and hopefully we'll be able to address the, uh, the final vote on the bill. Mr. Sabinski, why don't you uh, state your name in a way that I can repeat it, and then um, uh, give your testimony. Please be brief. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Sobosinski. Um, I'm a uh, livestock farmer from Wabasa, Minnesota. I actually have a fair to finish hog operation that I'm doing there, and right now I have pigs farrowing at home. <coughs> and, and I'm here to speak about the urgency of the issue, but I'm here speaking on behalf of the Land Stewardship Project. And our organization is the organization that's a third farmers, third rural, and third uh, rest of the state of Minnesota. And um, we're very concerned about the issue that's before us, uh, about the immediate need of getting health care relief to farmers and rural Minnesotans and hardworking people in the individual market immediately. Um, we look at this situation as a crisis. It's, it's like, uh, you know, you're picking up the phone, you're calling 911, and you're calling for the ambulance. And this call has gone on way too long, and so we think it's really important right now to get that immediate relief. Uh, I appreciate the, the fact that, that we're looking at the issue of reform too, but I also think it's important to prioritize, get the relief immediately right now. In terms of reform, I would like to urge some caution uh, on a couple of particular provisions. Uh, one of those provisions is bringing in for-profit insurance companies. Um, I would urge some caution on that. Um, we had a reason for not having nonprofits in the state for a long time. I think we ought to be concerned about that. I think before you bringing in for-profit insurance companies, maybe want to ask a little bit more thoroughly what went wrong with the current system that we have now in terms of the so-called nonprofits. Um, and also, I think the question has to be asked. Um, you know, the nonprofit insurance companies, for example, like Blue Cross Blue Shield, have about like 1.5 billion dollars in reserves. Those monies, those dollars, uh, are a lot of taxpayer money, money from public programs, um, money of people's premiums. So if you just do this flip to for-profit insurance companies, what's going to happen to those dollars? So I would urge caution in terms of what you do in terms of reform. But I would urge to look at a way move immediate relief now out there for farmers and rural business people and the people in, in, in this individual market. Let's get it out there now. Let's find a way to make this work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank you committee members for being involved. Thank you for your testimony. Is anyone else in the public here would like to speak to this bill briefly? <coughs> Seeing none, at this time we'll go to questions from members. Members, we do have the room reserved for this evening. It's almost 5 after 10. Uh, and if the majority of members believe we should come back tonight to continue to vet the bill, I'm certainly open to that. But we have two people on the uh, list right now. Representative Dean would like to ask a question of Commissioner Rockman if he's still here. <laughs> Just ran upstairs, so catch thank my breath. You, Representative D. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Rothman, I'll ask you the same question I asked Commissioner Franz earlier. Uh, we've got a, a proposal before us, uh, and uh, we had a delete all amendment from Representative Liebling that encompasses the governor's proposal for premium relief. Is there anything outside of the governor's proposal that you would? say that we should do or even consider or look at or think is feasible? Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Dean, I, I remain focused on 2017. On 2017, we need immediate relief into an infusion into the marketplace uh, for premium uh, relief. Um, and and the governor's proposal does that quick, more quickly. It's like a blood transfusion. The way I see it is the governor's proposal puts the money right in there, right into the pot in the bills and into the consumers. Um, it, will, it will start faster. Um, as it's implemented, we may be off by a month or so and we'll play catch up. But for all of 2017, consumers will get premium relief. 
The difficulty with the other proposal is that it won't happen until 20, it won't get up in place in time in, until 2018. And the way I would look at it is here we have a blood infusion or infusion for premium relief immediately now. That will help the most to stabilize the marketplace. Whereas all the mechanics and all that goes into the other proposal that, that the committee is looking at is like putting all the parts into a room and having everybody try to assemble it as fast as possible and it won't happen <coughs> fast enough. And thank, so it, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. I think I heard that's a no. Um, the other, uh, the other question I wanted to ask you, in, in the interest of time, Commissioner, is you said that the the that the individual market was collapsing, now, and we didn't find out about that until October first. I didn't get a letter, I didn't get an email, I didn't get a call, saying, "Hey, uh, this summer that the the individual market is collapsing." The, and I, I recall very clearly the press conferences that you had when you had the lowest rates in the country, uh, that we, we knew that right away uh, because of the crowing and the press conferences that we heard at that time. I didn't hear word one about this until way after the fair, October 1st, uh, that the individual market was collapsing. And since that period, that time, we've had one idea from the governor with blinders on that that's the only thing that we can do about it uh, weeks before an election. Uh, did you attempt to contact other members of the legislature during the summer uh, to let us know that the individual market had in fact collapsed? Commissioner Rothman. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, if you remember, I don't know if you're personally in the October 2015 press conference, I said that, and this was after the first year, that the rates were starting to tend to, to go up and that we needed reforms, October 2015. I called for stabilizing mechanisms in 2015 a long time ago. I'm on the record. And what I said was we needed these stabilizing mechanisms so we could avoid what happened this last year. It went, we discussed it, you know we've discussed it, and I think I'm on the record. Second of all, when Blue Cross announced that it was going to leave the marketplace in June, that was public, it made its own decision. That was, everybody knew that at the time. <clears throat> By law, rate review, as you know, is uh, a non-public, the Department of Commerce is required by law to keep the rate review process be a non-public. It's been that way for as long as the statute, as long as I understand it. So by law, I could not reveal any non-public information during the rate review process. And as soon as I could, I explained what happened and called for immediate reform, immediate stabilizing mechanisms, and within, I don't know how long we put it together, and as you heard Commissioner Franz, we worked very diligently to try to figure out the best way to infuse stabilizing premium dollar relief as fast as possible. Lastly, Commissioner, the uh, Representative David sent a letter to the governor saying that we should extend the open enrollment period so that people can buy insurance for longer so they don't get trapped without insurance uh, after the end of the month, which is today it's January 10th. Uh, so we're almost there. Uh, do you know, has he responded to that request? Yes. Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner as Ross. soon as the governor received the letter, I did as well. <clears throat> I spoke I, I, and I wrote to the uh, director of SOSIO, uh, Director Cunahan, asking for the extension. And as you recall, Governor Dayton said at a press conference that he was open to good ideas, and that was a good idea. That was a good. That is a good idea. It was a good idea. So I asked the Fed, federal agency to give us the extension on the open enrollment. It didn't. We did not uh, get it. Um, and <clears throat> Governor Dayton wrote to Secretary Burwell following my letter, asking for the extension. We have not, as far as I understand, we've looked at it. We haven't received a response back, as far as I know from Secretary Burwell with whether or not the extension could happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, members, we're just about out of time. We do have the room reserved tonight. <laughs> I've got two other members on the list here. 
if they can ask their questions afterwards or uh, otherwise very quickly, Representative Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, this is the question for <coughs> Representative Schumacher. Marker. Um, Minnesotans, because they are facing this high premium, premium increase on the individual mar market and they need help, um, and the deadline for enrolling in the 2017 health insurance is January the 31st. Uh, and, and just so I'm really clear about your bill and, and what it does, uh, can you tell me um, when you believe your bill will bring relief to Minnesota families? Represent, uh, Chair Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Moran. The uh, timeline for that would uh, be a little bit up in the air, but uh, we want it to be done as swiftly as possible, and we are interested in working with um, the departments, the commissioners, and uh, doing whatever we can in order to um, move whatever plan ends up moving along uh, the fastest way possible. And one last question, Representative uh, Mr. Moran. Chair. Uh, Representative Schumacher, um, and according to the commissioner, with all of the different processes and bureaucratic processes that has to take place, it seems like what I heard that it wouldn't be in 2017. Um, so are you open to maybe creating or looking into your bill um, and maybe separating some of these processes so that we can expedite the process so that Minnesota families can get the relief that they're asking for. Chair Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Moran. Uh, I think most of your the concern that you're raising with uh, that point would be in Article 1 of House File 1 and uh, House File 99, the bill that's in front of us today, um, doesn't really go into those portions in it. But again, we're uh, um, able and willing and um, interested in trying to move things along uh, swiftly in the process and and ensure that uh, relief can come quickly to Minnesotans. Representative Allen, very quickly, if you got a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, it seems here that it's, it's an all or nothing, um, and, I, and I'm confused as to why we can't separate out the delivery of the premium relief. So it, it's odd to me that, that this is the first time it's like kind of flipped where the GOP um, where, where we have to deliver some relief, some uh, rate premium relief, um, and, and that the GOP is basically creating a program um, and that will take months to um, uh, develop and implement. And the, it, I, separating the delivery from the reform. So it, it, the, the, it just, it's always very frustrating the way we operate here and how we complicate everything. The, the governor's proposal, the delivery of premium rate relief is something that we're very familiar with. We often administer uh, rebate credits and we put the burden on the employer business and then we, we reimburse them for their tax collection or for their burden, administrative burden. And so, and, and oftentimes we don't deliver the money directly to the, to the, to the uh, taxpayer or the individual because that we want the infusion into the market immediately. Um, and so this program here, I mean, there's a, uh, the governor put out a, a uh, arrows and to me this is, something you criticize us on creating these programs with all these eligibilities and and I think somebody mentioned that the only thing missing here is uh, drug testing and um, so so I, I I'm just at a loss as to it, why there's so much politicizing of the delivery system of this premium relief uh, thank you for your comments representative Allen uh, chair Schumacher is there any fur oh is there any further discussion to the bill <coughs> Hearing none, uh, Chair Schumacher, would you like to make to renew your motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, and I think uh, I'll forego any f uh, final comments. I think Representative Allen summed up their side pretty well, and uh, I think we're all ready to vote. Yeah, and I'd say too, we had a lot of information here. This is a process. Uh, say we need uh, bipartisan input, also from the agencies, and because uh, we want to do what's best not only for our medical. Uh, facilities, our uh, insurance industry, but most importantly for the uh, citizens of the state of Minnesota. With that, I will call, oh yeah, we had a roll call uh, requested and staff will take the, the roll call by Representative Lutheran.
Chair Schumacher? Aye. <coughs> Representative Grunhagen? Aye. Representative Liebling? No. Representative Albright? Yes. Representative Allen? No. Representative Baker? Yes. Representative Dean? Yep. Representative Flanagan? No. Representative Franson? Yes. Representative Freiburg? No. Representative Keel? Yes. Representative Kegel? No. Representative Kresha? Yes. Representative Lomer? Yes. Representative McDonald? Yes. Representative Moran? No. Representative Murphy? No. Representative Olson? No. Representative Peterson? Yes. Representative Quam? C. Si. Representative Stansted? No. Representative Tice? Yes. On HF 99, the vote was 13 ayes and 9 nays. Uh, the motion for the, the bill passes and it is recommended to be referred to Ways and Means. With that, members, uh, we stand adjourned. Uh, thank you for your testimony and vote.